Hey what's up guys it's Kelly and today I'm sharing my January reading wrap up. If you find yourself enjoying this video then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up it really helps me out and if you're new here and would like to see more of me then please subscribe. January didn't feel like the best reading month I was still pretty slumpy as we entered the new year but actually looking at the figures I'm really happy with the amount of reading that I did. Um, also I feel like I just started the year on the highest possible note because I read two books that I can just completely foresee being two of my favourite books of the year and I can on honestly also foresee myself rereading both of these before the year is out just because I loved them so much so <laughs> it was a good reading month in that I read a decent amount but also like I loved most of my reading so much. So I read four books in total and I DNF'd one book. I read 1,888 pages, 85 of which were for the book that I DNF'd and that amounted to 60.9 pages per day. I gave one book two stars and I gave three books five stars. Like I said it was a really good month so that averaged to 4.25 stars per book. As for my genre breakdown, I read three fantasy books, one contemporary book, and my DNF was historical fiction. As for age range, I read one middle grade book, three adult books, and my DNF was an adult book as well. Three of the books that I read were from my own TBR, and one of the books I read I borrowed. Then I also unhauled two books this month, one of the books that I'm going to be talking about and also my DNF, and I hauled one book. I'm really happy with that because one of my big goals for this year is to reduce my owned TBR. So I've, in total, I've reduced my owned TBR by three books this month because I read three and DNF'd one. So that's four books that I've taken off my owned TBR and I've added one onto it. So I'm doing pretty well and also I've decreased my physical library by one book because I unhold two and only hold one. So you know, I feel like I'm off to a cracking start for uh, reducing the amount of stuff that I have in this room and I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> it, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, like reducing my own TBR by three books and reducing my physical book collection by one book probably sounds like nothing to those of you who do like 50 book unhauls every month, but I for one struggle to unhaul books that I haven't already read or at least tried to read and for two I am I get very attached to things so if I've vaguely enjoyed something I want to keep it <laughs> so I really struggle with unhauling books and also because I have so much access to like books that I can read for free it it is difficult for me to prioritize my own TBR over like all the new releases that I have access to for free and also the fact that I have so much access to ARCs and I only brought one home with me this month like I think all of that because it's me is pretty impressive <laughs> so I'm gonna stop rambling about all the numbery type things and just get into the actual books that I read I might as well start with my DNF which was The Little Shop of Found Things by Paula Braxton and admittedly I was expecting to really really enjoy this book it was pitched to me as being quite similar to Outlander, which it is. Um, basically it is about this mother and her daughter who move to the small village in the English countryside to open an antique shop, but the daughter is a psychometrist so when she touches certain objects she can kind of feel the stories attached to them or feel the emotions attached to them. It's a very cool gift and being in the antique business it's extremely helpful because she can like touch something and she knows when it comes from and she can use these stories to sell things which is pretty cool. So they've moved to this town, they go to an antique fair and she finds this chatelaine that she's just inexplicably drawn to and a chatelaine is th these hooks that ladies used to keep on their skirts and they would have all sorts of attachments so like this one has a little notebook, um, I think it has a tiny pair of scissors, it might have a little pen attached, just like all manner of things that you could keep attached to you to make your daily life a little bit easier. So she finds the chatelaine and it's like screaming at her and she buys it, she takes it home, she starts like caring for it, trying to kind of figure out where it comes from, figure out the story that it wants to tell her 
and ultimately this chatelaine ends up transporting her back to the 1600s in Scotland where she meets, I don't remember his name, I want to say his name is Samuel, I think it might actually be Samuel, she meets this architect and obviously falls hopelessly in love and then is super conflicted because on the one hand she wants to stay in 17th century Scotland with her newfound love but also she knows that she should go back to the present time to look after her mother who is not super sprightly. She has almost crippling arthritis so she knows that she should be going back to look after her mother but also she's in love and it's a big internal struggle. I had conflicting feelings about this book. On the I read the first page and just thought the writing was so so good but as it kind of carried on and as I was introduced to some more of the characters and there was a lot more dialogue, the dialogue seemed so trite. Like, you know how siblings talk to each other in fan fiction? That's kind of how the dialogue felt to me. It just felt very, like, contrived <laughs> and I felt like I was reading kind of bad fanfic in the dialogue, but then the narration was still really lovely. But then after a couple more pages the narration started to feel more and more like the dialogue and it just it wasn't working for me and ultimately I just decided to do an effort. Like the writing wasn't great but it also wasn't terrible. I mean there are books that I've read in their entirety that have had much much worse writing so I think it was just a personality thing. Ultimately I also couldn't connect with any of the characters and I just didn't feel that compelled to know about their story and to, to, I, I didn't care that much about their lives and that's a big issue for me and I think doing my most disappointing reads of 2019 was kind of a big lesson for me because most of the books on that list the issue was that I wasn't connecting with the characters so I kind of just got to a point where I was like you know what I don't need to read this book where I'm not absolutely in love with the characters it wasn't for me and that's fine. Then I did start this book in November I think and I didn't finish it but I restarted it in January and just wow and that is The Night Circus by Erin Morganstone. This book guys. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it so much. So so utterly much. I was expecting to love it because I loved the Starless Sea but I don't think I had even imagined it could be this fantastic. So The Night Circus follows Celia and Marco who are two magicians or illusionists who have been trained since childhood to compete in this game. That's, that's all their mentors will tell them about it but it's a game and the stage for them to participate in this game is the Night Circus. It's a magical place full of weird and wonderful things and weird and wonderful characters. Neither Celia nor Marco truly understands the rules of the game because they won't be told, they're, they're never told anything. They just keep being told to keep using their powers, keep using their abilities and that eventually the game will play itself out. But when they discover that they are each other's adversaries, they see it as an opportunity to collaborate and they start working together to make in these incredible additions to the circus. Little do they know that the game is a lot more deadly than they've been told. And without realising this, they tumble headfirst into this incredible love affair. It's just so intense. Erin Morgenstern's ability to do slow burn romance is second to none. It's the sort of it's the sort of romance where you know they brush fingertips and like a chill runs through you because it's so charged with emotion and love and desire and longing and just the way she writes romance is just I I could read it all day. I was so in love with this book. I mean, th I love stories about the circus. I have since I was about five years old and I read, what do you, I don't even remember whose circus it was, Mr. Galliano's circus. 
I think it was Mr. Galliano's Circus, which is an Enid Blyton book, and it was so good. So I've always loved stories about the circus. We know I love a good slow burn romance, and I love stories about magic. I love stories about magicians. I love the very gentle magic that you get in this, where it is fantasy, but it's still almost believable because it's very illusionary type magic. So the whole time you're reading this you know it's magic but also you're looking for like a logical basis for it. It's just, it's everything that I love combined in a book. And it was just so, so good. The Star of the Sea was my book of the year last year. I honestly feel like The Night Circus might be my book of the year this year. I don't, I don't want to put that out into the universe in January already because I feel like it's just setting myself up to not enjoy something later in the year as much as I could because I don't want it to, I don't want to be too in my head about the fact that this will be my favourite book of the year but like I think it has a really good shot <laughs> because I think I, I couldn't imagine loving anything more than The Starless Sea but I think I loved this more I just I don't even know what else to say about this book just if you haven't read it already do it I've spent the last nine years having people tell me to read this book and it's one of those cases where I'm mad at myself for not having read it nine years ago because I think of all the times I could have reread it since then. <laughs> it was one of those books that I read and just thought like I don't want to live in a world where this book doesn't exist because just its existence makes me happier. I was so ensconced in this world that when I wasn't reading it I was just thinking about it constantly and it just was reading it was such an incredible experience. We know I love Erin Morgenstern's writing, her world building as, w as it was in The Starless Sea was just perfect. Every scene she described I felt like I was right there alongside the characters. I could see and smell and taste and hear everything that was going on around me. It was so immersive and I just... I loved it so much. Based on the ratings that I told you guys I gave out this month, this is obviously either going to be a 2 or a 5, so I'm pretty sure you can guess which one it was. <laughs> then I started reading Flanked by Jen Kalanita, which I half intended to do the Visco Girls readathon and then forgot that I was doing it, but one of the prompts was to read a book with a beautiful cover, and I have always loved this cover. This was a complete cover buy for me. I picked it up at a sale and loved the cover so much and I read the synopsis and thought it sounded like okay but just I loved the cover so much that I bought it and honestly the cover was probably the thing that I loved the most about it. This is part of the Fairy Tale Reform School series so it takes place at the Fairy Tale Reform School and this is a school run by reformed villains. So Cinderella's stepmother is the headmistress, she formed the school, the big bad wolf is a teacher Ursula teaches etiquette and dancing, the evil queen from Sleeping Beauty is does like group therapy, so it's all of these reformed villains who have come together to help kids, to basically to stop them from becoming villains. So it's a school for juvenile delinquents, run by former villains. It sounded great, right? And the premise, I still maintain, is fantastic, but the execution just wasn't there for me. I felt like it should have been a little older. This is middle grade, but it's on the younger end of the spectrum. I'd say that this is great for like an 8 or 9 year old, whereas I think if it had been written for like an 11 or 12 year old, it could have been really special. It it could have been a little bit darker, a little bit more intense. I just think that it had a lot of potential that it didn't reach because it all felt very surface level. There wasn't a lot of depth to any of the characters and the writing wasn't great, it, it, it wasn't awful, like for an eight-year-old child it would probably be really really good, but I think that this was just one of those cases where middle grade doesn't translate to adults and I just am too old and have too high standards to read this, so if you're thinking about getting this for a child in your life, probably would recommend, but would not recommend this if you are looking to read more middle grade. So you can probably guess that this was my two star read of the month. And then I read Christmas Shopaholic by Sophie Kinsella and I loved this. This is the second Shopaholic book that I've read, it's the ninth in the series, 
I have read the first book and I used to own two or three of the other books but then I went through a phase of being like really anti chiclet not anti the idea of it I was still like you do you if you enjoy reading chiclet but I was pretty sure that I had no interest in reading it anymore now that I'm not so much only interested in fantasy I have rediscovered my love for chiclet and I have, and now having read this, I have many regrets about getting rid of those other books in the series because now I'm going to have to buy them again because this was so good that I just want to go back and read the whole series because I loved it so much. So this follows Becky Bloomwood who is having to host Christmas for the first time. Her parents always host Christmas but they've just moved to a flat in Shoreditch and have asked her to please host Christmas for them. It sounds fine, right? You know, she's an adult human. Like, she's got her life together somewhat. She's got a job and a husband and a kid and it shouldn't be that difficult to host Christmas, right? The problem is, it's not just going to be a quiet little Christmas with her mum and dad. Her best friend Suze and her husband have somehow wound up coming along with their kids. Her mum's best friend and husband are coming along as well. And most difficult of all, Becky has to cater for her half-sister Jess who is a strict vegan and very anti the consumerist side of Christmas. She's very strictly opposed to anything that isn't 100% sustainable and eco-friendly and Becky now has to a find a vegan turkey and b manage to decorate and buy gifts in a way that aren't going to offend Jess's sensibilities. <laughs> all in all this was just a wonderfully fun romp. Um, Sophie Kinsella books do tend to be somewhat ridiculous. Her heroines are always in the middle of the most ridiculous situations, but watching them come through them is always extremely entertaining. I mean, this, I won't give you context because spoilers, but this book does feature a scene where Becky is dressed as Mrs. Santa and gets stuck in a chimney. Picture that in your minds, if you will. So I just had so much fun reading this. It's a super holiday read if you're just looking for something lighthearted and fun that you don't have to concentrate on too much, but that will keep you smiling the whole way through and just bring you a lot of joy and make you very happy. I highly, highly recommend this, or honestly anything by Sophie, Sophie Kinsella. So obviously I gave this five out of five stars and I definitely want to read more Sophie Kinsella books this year. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I also would like to read more books by authors like her, so if you have any recommendations then please leave them in the comments, because sometimes you just need a book that is going to bring you happy, right? I mean, I love me some angst as much as the next person, which the next book that I talk about will prove, but sometimes I just want to feel some joy. So speaking of angst, the final book that I read in January 2020 was House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Maas, the first book in the Crescent City series. I know. Um, I am the biggest Sarah J Maas fangirl, like, it's insane. <laughs> I love her so much. I love all of her books so much. And I was insanely jealous of all the people I saw getting arcs of this until our Jonathan Ball children's rep arrived at my store, subbed it into us, and said that she was getting an arc that she could spread around to the Cape Town booksellers. I somehow managed to get myself first on the list and I read it. It was so, so good. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I am going to do a spoiler free review of it, followed by a spoilery vlog of me reading it. I was gonna upload it on release date but let me know if you guys would actually like it sooner. So this is an urban fantasy set in Crescent City and it follows a half human half fae woman called Bryce Quinlan who her life is pretty good you know she works during the day she parties all night every night she has amazing friends until one of them gets brutally murdered. Two years later, the person accused of the murder is behind bars, but the murders start up again with the same MO. 
and Bryce gets thrown into the investigation. Alongside her is Hunt Athalar, a notorious fallen angel who is now enslaved to the governor and works as his personal assassin. However, when these murders start up again, he gets offered a deal. Help us solve the case, we'll bring you much, much closer to earning your freedom. So the two of them together start investigating these murders, which takes them through the seedy underside of the city, into all sorts of wonderfully dangerous scenarios, <laughs> and the more time they spend together, the more they realise that they're inexplicably drawn to each other with a blazing passion. This book, guys, I loved it so much. Oh my gosh. It's just so good. The world building was insane. I am obsessed with the new world that she's created. I, I want to live there. It sounds really dangerous, but like, I want to live there. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. I finished the book on Wednesday, it's now Sunday, and I just haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Like, I am as ensconced in this world as I was in the Night Circus. Like, I just, I just want to be in Crescent City all the time. I already need book two. Book one isn't even out yet and I'm like desperate for book two because I need more of this world. We all know Sarah J Maas knows how to write characters and she knows how to write that intense slow burn romance that just constantly leaves you wanting more. <sighs> Let me just say this book was an emotional roller coaster, guys. You'll be able to see when I upload my vlog <laughs> but like the emotions that this book elicited, wow. Like I said, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I am going to be doing a review on it. All you have to know is I loved it. It was easily a five star read and I'm definitely going to be rereading it when the book actually comes out because damn. So those are the books that I read in January and my camera battery is squawking at me so I'd better wrap this up. If you have any thoughts on any of the books that I mentioned please leave them in the comments below or feel free to leave me your own January wrap-ups to go and have a look at. I'd love to see what you guys were reading. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and I'll see you all again very soon. Bye!